How does a father who presumably has never prepared himself for this moment, because you, of course, hope like hell it'll never happen, how do you even begin to figure out how to put one foot in front of another after this happens? Yeah. Well, as, as you saw in that um, sample uh, you read, about, I, I, I ha um, I'm not phobic about my own death. Um, I have elaborate plans in place. There are documents in file and, you know, all my, by the way, one of the things I recommend anyone listen, if you take one thing away from this, make sure you have a list of your passwords for all your computer programs and make sure your loved ones know where they are. Um, so I have I have that in a folder. You know, here are my passwords. Um, you know, here's what here's when the gas bill is due. Um, here's my will in the folder. Um, here's the insurance policy. It's all. And my wife and I had begun planning where we would uh, be buried someday um, together. And um, and we had revolved many options, and we finally resolved. There's a small Jewish cemetery near Prince Edward County, um, halfway between Trenton and Belleville, just east of the Canadian Forces Base. And uh, we thought, you know, that and that 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 would be convenient to where our children would be because they're they're going to stay in Prince Edward County. Um, so we'd begun shopping for that, and then we had to suddenly, very fast, um, make all the decisions that we were non-phobically preparing for ourselves, uh, and and make them for a child. And that is, um, as everyone's got losses, the the thing about the the loss of a the loss of a child. I mean, there are many kind of griefs. Um, you know, uh, I think Canadians have just witnessed um, the incredibly beautiful uh, ceremony for former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney and saw his loving family there. But uh, there are things you psychically prepare for, even if you never talk about the husbands and wives psychically prepare one of us will outlive the other. That's that just has to be the way. Um, but children certainly prepare for their parents as, as much as they dread it. They're, they're ready for it. Um, you're not ready for the, the um, loss of a child. And there's there's um, there's something else I just I read a. Uh, something just today by a, a writer who lost his beloved partner of many years and, and how he's, he's begun to see other people and when he flirts with other women that he thinks about what his partner would think and he thinks about it with some warmth and amusement. Well, he can love your partner as much as that man did and still two or three years later begin to see other women. There, there's no other shot. Oh. Um, there's no... <laughs> You don't say, oh, oh, we'll have, you know, that's it. That, that, and with this, and of course... Um, the door is closed behind you uh, because this was going to be your future. Um, for me, I think great. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a religious believer, but I'm not a. I I don't have much confidence in any individual consciousness after death. Um, so I, I don't think for me there's any hope. Uh, but my hope was always that um, my children would be happy. I provide for them and, and leave them memories of me and. Um, and, and they'd at first be sad and then think, you know, then, then be, then laugh. Um, that's the way of the world. I imagine you have been in, inundated by those who want to do the right thing, say the right thing, yeah. be helpful, all of that. What have yeah. you learned and what can you tell us on that list of, here's a good thing to say, here is something you yeah. should never say? Um, Look, the things you should never say are so, I won't insult the TVO audience by suggesting that there's anyone who would watch this program who would say something you shouldn't say. Um, the, the big problem that the kind of sensitive and intelligent person would watch you would have is people are sometimes afraid to say anything because they become so afraid of saying the wrong thing, they say nothing. Mm -hmm. So unless you are just a boorish, oafish person, uh, anything you say is going to be better than, than nothing. And it really comforts and some things, and just because of who, there's a random process that there are many people who comfort, there's a person who's consoled, and, and different people will, will respond to different things. So you may, be, you may say the right thing, and it may be as beautiful as you say it. It might not be the thing that that person needed to hear. That, that it's okay. It's like the total volume. It's, it's the things that fill the air. Um, if there's enough confetti in the air, you're going to, you can catch some of it. Um, and for us, the... Um, the thing we keep quoting back and forth to each other. Um, and I, I, by the way, I've used this story before and the, the person heard it and said, you can use my name, so I will use the name. Um, uh, we got a note from someone I know a little bit who's a senior um, agent at, at WME, Robert Newman. And he lost his daughter, Leah Newman, at age 33. She died after giving birth to a, a child. Uh, and they, he and his wife, Cindy, had, they had four children and this was one, the child who most wanted a child of her own and then, and then lost her life giving birth to the healthy child that lost her own life. And uh, we have had some conversations with, with the Newman family. And uh, Robert, being a Hollywood agent, said, 
the thing in Age of D's that I found. Danielle and I have quoted this 50 times. He said, if, if the angel of death were to appear to you as a parent and say, I can bring your child back, but you have to jump off this 10-story building, you do it without looking back. You do it with a smile on your face. He said, but <laughs> that's not on the table. <laughs> and that phrase that's not on the table uh, has become as we, we as we think you know we have two other children we have to live for them we have a, a marriage we have to keep that going we have a lot of other dogs in this house and they all need to be fed every damn day two times and walked um so there's there you can't exit this earth um so you have to focus on what's on the table and what's not on the table and for me that was helpful but so the, but i would say if you're listening to this for any kind of inspiration what to do don't worry, just do something. And maybe it'll be the right thing, maybe not, but you'll be one of 40 people. And I guarantee one of them will say the weird thing in the way that that's not on the table resonated with Danielle and me, that somebody will say it. Maybe it'll be you, but just hmm. just don't be afraid uh, because um, you're not going to say the Oprah's thing. Uh, I, I, there are one or two people. I mean, I, we heard, have heard from so many people that just because of the law of big numbers, there were one or two Oaths. But in... Um, if it's less public and instead of hearing from hundreds or thousands, you hear from dozens, there aren't going to be any oafs. There, there are not so many. Most people in the world reserve their oafish behavior for trolling on the Internet, not for talking to grieving people. Right on. You just referenced the fact that you have two other children and who, yeah. I have to say, spoke absolutely magnificently at their sister's funeral. They were incredible. Yeah. How, uh, th I wonder if you can compare the kind of grief they are experiencing at losing a sibling versus what you are going through yeah. as a parent. Well, um, I've heard now from a number of people who have been in this situation themselves uh, that sibling loss is really an underappreciated um, uh, phenomenon um, because everyone gets that the parents of a lost child are going to be crushed. Um, but the loss of the siblings is huge too. Um, and I mean, our three children were particularly close, um, but even when not close, I mean, even if, think of it, I mean, if you have, if you're married and you have a brother or sister and the conversation goes on to weird things that happened in your family in 1969, your spouse is going to go to bed before your brother or sister does. And they're going to get weary of the whole subject. The only two, the only people who are interested in the tiny little civilization that was your childhood. Um, are your siblings. Not even your loving spouse can endure as much of it as your siblings can. <laughs> and so um, when the, they are co-citizens of this, of this tiny civilization that was, that was your childhood and the civilization that is just lost, uh, childhood is always lost. Um, but it, you, you keep it alive inside you, but it, it's, it's gone. Um, and in our, case, in our case, there was a big age gap between the two older children, two years apart, and, and the youngest, B, who was eight years younger than her brother and 10 years younger than her sister. When sisters are 10 years apart, I've observed that one of two things can happen. Either that's a tremendous maker of distance because their experiences are so different, or it's tremendous bonding um, uh, relationship because the 10-year-old sister becomes a kind of backup mom, uh, a cooler and more understanding mom than the actual mom. <laughs> <laughs> a, a mom you can tell some of your less creditable adventures to in a way that you'd better, the, the two of you can be co-conspirators and coming covering them up from the actual mom who would be upset. And so Brandon B had this uh, intense relationship. Nat, Nat, Nat and Miranda had this intense relationship and they are, um, but they're carrying on in her, uh, they're, they're going to keep her memory alive. I mean, I, you know, um, Odds are I, I've got only so many years of keeping her memory green, but uh, those two children and their children in time will keep her memory green into the next century. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.